How's it going, you guys? It's Scott with Everyday Home Repairs, and today I want to show you how to do a simple replacement of an electrical outlet. Now, many of us homeowners, we only do this every so often, and maybe this is the first time you're approaching this type of project. Now, most homeowners can handle this type of update and they can actually do that according to code in their area if it's their own home. But a classic problem is I might show you only one scenario and you start to hit all sorts of speed bumps and roadblocks and it really extends out your project. You're taking five trips to home improvement store and really the end product isn't what you're looking for. So I'm gonna go over 10 different mistakes or challenges that you can face and how to fix those. So we'll progress through a normal replacement, but go over multiple different scenarios to make sure you don't get stuck and you know how to overcome that mistake to make sure you have a safe and secure installation of your new outlet. And maybe you've installed hundreds or even thousands of outlets over your careers. Even for you, I bet you're gonna learn something along the way. So let's jump into it. And number one, before we even take the face plate off, especially as a DIYer, we should not be working on live electrical circuits. You need some minimal tools to test out your circuits and you should not be taking on this task if you don't have an outlet tester like this one that you can plug into this live circuit. I see two amber LEDs, which indicates that this circuit is live and wired correctly. And it's also nice just to have a non-contact voltage tester that you test out on the live circuit, confirming it's working before you go and actually turn off your breaker, which we'll do right now. And I'll keep my outlet tester plugged in so when I trip the breaker, I can see those lights go off and confirm that the circuit is no longer live. Hopefully yours are labeled like this. If not, you're gonna have to do a little bit of guessing and checking, and it might be a two-person operation. Right here, my receptacles in the big garage are what I'm gonna to want to turn off. All right, de-energized circuit. I'm actually gonna work on a standard duplex outlet. This is a decor outlet and it actually has no fasteners on the outside. I just wanted to show you in case you had one like this. Usually on the bottom, you can start prying uh, this loose. The fasteners are underneath this outside cover. And there's usually about four snaps that you'll be prying away to get that off. And then you'll have two Phillips head screws that has this plate on, and then you can get access to your outlet, just in case this is the configuration that you have. Also note, depending on who painted your walls last, before taking the faceplate off, you might wanna score all the way around the edges, and that's gonna ensure if there's paint on your faceplate, when you take the faceplate off, it's not gonna peel away your paint causing wall damage, which is a bummer when you're just trying to do an electrical project and you turn it into a painting project. So number two out of the 10 mistakes is picking the wrong screwdriver. I recommend a multi-bed, it's just perfect for this type of project. You can have a small flat head like this to remove your face plate, then swap out to the bed to remove the outlet. But instead of a Phillips head, that's the mistake. A lot of people go for Phillips head. That's gonna be prone to camming out or stripping out your screws. Go for the number one Robertson or square drive. Now, if you need a link to this tool or many other tools that we use or supplies we use, you can see a link in the description or you can scan the QR code if you're watching on your TV. That's the easy way and it'll bring all the tools up on your phone. So now that we have the outlet removed, we can see our third and fourth mistake or speed bump that we might encounter. Number three is the junction box. So here we have the equivalent of what would be called a new work box. This was installed before drywall when we had access to the studs and it's secured by nail. Now those nails can work out over time or maybe you have an old work box that has these tabs and it's actually just secured to the drywall. If you have an old work box, you have these two screws here, you might be able to tighten those up and the junction box will tighten up. That would be a good thing and an easy fix. But if you have a new work box and it has loosened up over time, I'll show you how to fix that. But number four, you can see I can't really pull this outlet out any further. It has short wires. So that'd be your fourth issue that can really cause you problems. Now code says that you need six inches from the edge of the sheathing inside your box. So that yellow sheathing in this instance, because this is 12 to Romex, 
So it'd be six inches and at least three inches past the front of the box itself. So we're nowhere close to that and that causes issues when we need to service this outlet or replace the outlet like we're trying to do. So let me show you how to fix these. And remember down in the timeline of this video, you can see each one of these sections. So if yours look good, you do not have short wires, you do not have a loose junction box, you can skip ahead to the next part to save yourself some time. So let's go ahead and address a loose junction box. Now this would be a new work box. We'll loosen up those screw terminals with the number one square drive and take off our conductors in the bare ground. Then we'll use an oscillating tool here to trim off these plastic tabs and free up the two nails that are holding that new work box in. Take your time and you really don't want to cause any drywall damage here. So you might have to kind of go back and forth until you get it completely freed up. And those little plastic tabs, you can't have one last one remaining before getting it out, but just trim that off and reduce the amount of damage you're making. So you'll be able to install this south wire box that has the fasteners inside the box and can secure to the stud without having access to nail in any nails but I swap out these Phillips heads for some torque heads, and that's gonna help to give a nice secure hold against that stud. So we'll pull the wires through, and then we'll go ahead and secure those two screws into the stud to get a secure box. So fixing number four, which was the short wires. We'll just use 12-2 Romex and take out the two conductors in the bare ground, and that will be our extension wires here that we'll use Wago lever nuts to connect up to the short wires. There's two wire and inline splice. The two wire here, both of those will come out the same end, and then the inline splice, it comes out opposite ends. So you pick the ones that are easiest to use for your application. Here, I'll just pick the two wire, but that's also why I recommend the assortment box, which you'll find in the link in the description, so you can mix and match to whatever you're doing for that day. And then we'll just tuck back the bare grounds on one side with the neutrals and the hot conductor on the other side. So we're getting there. Now we have properly sized conductors in our ground and also a secure junction box. Now, number five, what happens if you don't have a ground? You have older wiring in your home, no ground. Are you stuck with two prong outlets? Not so fast, there is some hope, but there's also a ton of different ways you can do this wrong. So I'll show you an alternative here in one minute. But first, I just wanna give you an update. We did an initiative last year and the start of this year on getting a better understanding on homeowner's insurance. I know personally for me, homeowner's insurance has went up about 50% in the last three years and many parts of the country are way worse than that. So it's becoming a larger and larger slice of the overall picture of what we have to pay for our homes. So what we're doing about that is there's a link in the description where you can go and fill out what are you seeing? What are you seeing for your house in your state what liability coverage are you carrying? What's your deductible? And then we pool that information together. And if you complete the survey, we can send you a picture of your state where we give you a view of all the other viewers on average, what are they seeing? So then you can kind of compare what do you have coverage and also premium for your home compared to others in your state so you can make a more informed decision. And two out of three of you said independent insurance agents are a better option. They go out and shop for you. They go to multiple insurance carriers and shop to get the best rate and the best coverage. So we are also working on that nationwide network of trusted independent agents. So if you see, hey, I'm paying way more than everybody else in my state, maybe that makes sense for you to start to get a new quote to try to bring that cost back down a little bit, fighting all those recent increases. So if you've already filled out the survey, thank you. If not, link in the description, or you can just use this QR code if you're watching on your TV. It only takes one or two minutes, and the more responses we get, the better our state-specific reports are, and then we just get smarter together. So back to the ground wire. If you do not have a ground, there's no ground in your system, which is common depending on the age of your home, do not just use a standard residential three-prong outlet and connect up your black hot conductor and your white neutral conductor. Technically, that will power your devices, but you will not have a ground. So you might plug in an appliance with three prongs, and that ground prong is the equipment ground, and that can cause a dangerous situation where maybe there is a metal case around that appliance, there's an internal short, and that case is gonna become your hot conductor looking for a ground, which you do not have. So if you touch that appliance, guess what? You might become the ground, and that is a dangerous situation. So do not just connect up a three prong. The better path, if you actually want an outlet that can take three prong appliances, you would use a GFCI outlet. Now you would connect that up to the line side. 
you'd put your neutral to the silver and your hot to the gold terminal and you do not need a ground and you're still covered. Why is that? It's because the GFCI does not need a ground to operate correctly. It detects if there's a difference between the hot and neutral. So if you touch that appliance and now you became the ground, well, there would be a difference between those two conductors and it would trip. It would cut the power off and protect you. So that's why these can be installed only with two wires, but you do need to use the proper labeling on your faceplate, just saying there is no equipment ground. And then I'll show you a little bit later on, there's even some new GFCIs. I don't know if you've seen these, but they're from Leviton and there's some pretty cool new devices coming out that might help you out as a DIYer, but let's jump into number six. So now we're putting the new device on and you should not use what's called backstabbing. That would be where you're using 14 gauge wire and just pushing it into the back of a cheap residential grade duplex outlet or a Decora series like this. Now this one has backstabbing, it's in my house, and believe it or not, a former electrician owned this house, and he's got 14 gauge water, which I don't love. I, I like serving the outlets with 12 gauge, even if you're using the 15 amp outlets, but he also used backstabbing throughout and has exposed copper where he cut back a little bit too much insulation. So in general for number six, do not go with backstabbing, do not go with cheap, residential grade outlets, I'll show you the better option. This one also is gonna show you my number seven and that is do not leave the screw terminals out. Now when you use backstabbing, that is independent of the screw terminal. So you don't have to screw down the screw terminals to make sure that those are secure. But if you do not, it just opens up a larger width of the overall package. You can see the difference here, screw terminals out compared to screw terminals in. So always make it a best practice, tighten in your screw terminals to slim up the width of your outlet. So for number eight, it's stripping the correct amount of wire, not too little and not too much. This is the type of outlet, it's an Eaton, and really Eaton, Leviton, Legrand, Hubble, many different brands I recommend just going with their commercial grade. They're all good. I have actually cut open and look at the internals on all of them, and it's just superior from the residential grade and you're gonna be able to use what's called back wiring. You see that plate in there? So you're gonna put the wire between the plate and then you tighten the screw in and that's how you secure it. But making sure you strip the correct amount of insulation, right here we can reference this strip gauge. So you just put your wire in, mark that, and then you know exactly how much insulation that you will strip off of that wire so that it can be properly installed into the outlet and not have a bunch of excess carrying over. Now remember, we talked about having the right tool for the job, and you can see the exact amount of insulation bottoms out, and then we have insulation all the way up to the end here. For that screwdriver, Although it might look like a Phillips head, a number one square drive, a Robertson, or even a combo drive is gonna work the best to secure that up. And for best practices, when you're wiring your outlets, it actually is best to always start off with your bare ground. That would be best practice. But I wanna show kind of a failure mode of this commercial grade if I stripped off too much wire. So maybe I didn't reference my strip guide, went a little too aggressive, and if you're doing what's called side wiring, you actually would strip off a little bit more to make what's called a J-hook. This strip gauge here is referencing the feature that is the back wiring feature. Do not get that confused with back stabbing. Since we are tightening those plates here, it is not the same thing. The back stabbing just has one piece of metal there that holds in that wire you are actually not tightening the screw down, tightening that plate on that wire. So here's the failure mode if you strip too much insulation. And usually how this actually fails is let's say you had a bare ground in your plastic box and you're pushing everything back in and then for whatever reason that bare ground got pushed up and then boom, it made contact with that hot conductor on the ground and then that trips your breaker. So that's the most common failure mode I've seen when you strip off too much insulation, too little, and you might not be getting the contact between the screw terminal and the actual copper that you're looking for in your conductors. All right, so I'll go ahead and install this commercial grade, but we will also talk about these guys. Leviton's coming out 
with more and more products in their Edge series, which honestly, I kind of think is going to be the future, especially for DIYers like us. Having these levers, and that is how you secure, it's kind of like a Wago lever nut built into your outlet. They used to just have the Decora series, but now just found a duplex. So this is an upgrade to their design. And you'll see these links in the description. And even a GFCI is out there now. And this design is really nice. There's kind of an over center cam there that locks it out. Pretty cool design. Let me know if you guys want me to open these up and do a teardown. Since these are brand new products, we could do a teardown and look at the internals if you're interested. And number nine is reversing your polarity or just incorrectly wiring your hot and neutral conductors. Here we got our hot. I'm just going to strip off the correct amount of insulation. You can also, if you're doing a lot of outlets, you can get one of these strippers, which you can set that end gauge and strip to the exact size automatically each and every time. And it's super fast if you're doing a bunch of different outlets. But once we have these stripped off, I'll also make a J hook here in the bare copper because on the commercial grade, although we're gonna use back wiring for the neutrals and hot, we do have to do a clockwise J hook around the green ground terminal, which is best practice to do first. And we'll go ahead and tighten that up with that number one square drive bit. Again, that is what I recommend to use for a screwdriver. We'll go onto our neutrals using the back wire. We'll also tighten up that bottom one, even though it won't really hang out like you'd see in a residential grade. And then also tighten up our hot conductor on our gold terminal. Now this is correct polarity and it is correctly wired. That is what you're looking for. Then we'll tuck those wires back in, trying to keep the neutral and ground on one side, the hot conductor on the other side. And then we'll start to tighten up our mounting screws. Now the bottom has a little more drywall cut out. So I'm going to use these spacers and that's going to help you correct what's called a sunken outlet. Just a few of these I'll put behind the yoke or the bracket there on the actual mounting screw. So it goes right around the mounting screw. And then when you tighten this up, it kind of secures it in. Even if you don't have drywall to press against that yoke, the spacers will help hold it into place. And then number 10 is you get to the finish line, you go to put back on your face plate and maybe you have some paint damage. Maybe there's a big cut where you see a hole where the drywall was overcut. Maybe you just have a small little damage here from my oscillating tool. Well, there are different size of face plates. So you might be able to actually correct this issue without a big problem. And this is actually the smallest one. And if we line up, you can see they kind of scale up. So if you wanted to go with a medium size, that is pretty good coverage. Or if you need to go to a jumbo to kind of cover up some imperfections, you can do that as well. Sometimes it's hard to find these larger ones at your home improvement store. So you'll see links in the description. You might need to snag them off Amazon just to get your faceplate and wall looking good. And then if you really want to finish it off, you can either, either leave your screws in the horizontal or vertical position. And that's going to give you the professional look to complete your project. So let me know if you guys have any questions down in the comments. I'd love to jump in there and help you out. And also let me know what you think on these Leviton lever edges. I honestly think this is the direction of things and Leviton's definitely expanding their lineup. So I imagine the initial version, the Decora series sold really well and now they're expanding it out. Now, if you need a little bit more help, maybe you want to relocate an outlet, check out this video right here and we'll go through the complete process and actually we'll do it without even going in the attic or in a crawl space. So it kind of covers the most applications, whether you have a slab or not, you can still do that project. Or if you want to dive a little bit deeper and further your knowledge in how to test and troubleshoot these circuits, check out this video right here. I'll walk you through a multimeter, which is a great tool to have for any homeowner that's diving into DIY electrical. So thanks for joining me on this video and we'll catch you on one of those next ones. Take care.